So today we're just going to start off with um, some introductions of who's on the panel. Um, I'll start and then we'll go to Chloe and we'll go around that way. And then we've got a few questions planned. Um, we've also got some of those questions from people in the audience. So they are our questions, but it's people in the audience asking them. Um, so first off, I am Claire McArdle and um, I'm a jeweler, artist, maker, all those things. Um, I've been practicing for 11 years um, and I guess, I don't know, where do I fit into contemporary jewellery? Um, yeah, I really should have thought about this a bit more <laughs> before we started. <laughs> I was too busy writing the questions. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where I fit in. I think you find your own place in the community and maybe you build your own community as well with what you want to see in the world. Um, yeah, Chloe. Hi, I'm Chloe Powell. Um, I work with Claire on Radiant Pavilion. Um, I've been in this community, I suppose, for about 12 years now when I started studying in Adelaide. Um, haven't yet found a way out of it, which at times <laughs> I've wanted to do, um, but we'll kind of unpack that later. Um, and I suppose I fit into it in terms of, um, I guess, helping things happen um, and being like an infrastructural support. I had studied, but I'm not a maker, and I realised that while studying. So I suppose my role is, yeah, a support role for the artists. So. Burley? Me, okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Belinda Newick. Um, I have, I'm a jeweller, I'm an educator, um, and more recently an independent curator. Um, I've been making and exhibiting for about 24 years now, which I had to try and count. Um, and I've been working in jewellery education for 12 years. And um, as far as fitting into the community, um, it's through all of those things. Yeah. Hi, my name's Fiona Fitzgerald. Um, I'm an emerging jeweller. I'm very new to this community. I've only just graduated from Melbourne Polytechnic last year, so two years only in making. Um, where I fit in, well, I, I think the jewellery community has been really surprising to me as a, a newbie because everyone's been very, very welcoming and I think it's the first time I've actually ever felt part of a community. Um, so I'm trying to get myself involved in any way I can and, yeah, so I've just been volunteering and things like that. But, yeah, it's, it's been a very welcoming community and I find that even people that have been making for 40 years still remember what it was like when they first started and they know what it's like and they can connect to you and, and they, they really do sort of uh, show you that kind of kindness. So it's really good. Kel, can you hear us? Yep. Hi everyone, I'm Kelly McDonald. I am. Uh, I studied a really long time ago and then made for a few years, then had a big hiatus and came back to jewellery as a maker, an educator. Uh, I've been a long time participant in the Handshake Project, which is a mentor and exhibition project you might have heard of that Peter Decker set up. Also, um, as, as a part of a small collective occupation artist and I'm also a current student so I feel like I have a sort of bit of a handle across all aspects of, of contemporary jewellery. Well, some anyway. <laughs> yep. That's me. Uh, hello, I'm Katie Scott. I um, have been part of this community for about 16 years, I think it's coming up to. First as a student, of course, um, then very briefly as a maker. And the way things shook out, I ended up being um, a curator and gallery director. So um, I now sit outside of the making and very much in the curating, selling, writing about and thinking about and talking to people about jewellery. Oh, hello, uh, my name's Lindy McSwan. I'm a maker of uh, vessels, objects and sometimes jewellery. Um, I've been involved with the community for a considerable time. Um, I studied at MIT quite some time ago and had a break between starting RMIT in 2010, finishing honours 2014 and I worked in a studio for three years um, before I came back last year to study Masters here at um, RMIT again. Um, and look, I suppose at the moment, yeah, look, being a researcher um, with my practice, 
are still in sort of in the emerging artist maker category. So, um, yeah. Hi, I'm Anna Gray. Um, I do a bit of everything, <laughs> um, <laughs> not necessarily well. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I make jewellery, um, I also do a bit of writing about jewellery and curating um, and I co-run Temp Contemp at North City 4 um, and I'm on the North City 4 board because uh, I love that studio so much, <laughs> never getting rid of me. <laughs> um, I've been in the contemporary jewellery community I guess since I started studying jewellery at TAFE in Hobart. Um, so I guess I've been a part of a few different jewellery communities um, and I definitely fit in at North City 4, or I hope I do. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think like Fiona said, I kind of feel like this is the first community that I've kind of fit into, so it's nice. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vito Villa. Um, I'm a uh, silversmith. I've been practicing for 20 odd years um, and I've also been working in the education uh, area for oh, probably at least 15 years. Um, my practice involves um, working with traditional silversmithing methods and sculpture processes as well as new, newer technologies. Um, where do I fit in? Um, I think for me it is more useful to frame that question as what can I contribute um, and what I hope I'm contributing is to the dialogue of um, how we can keep making alive and lively. Um, how can we work with materials in a lively manner and um, how can we keep the practice alive and lively? Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Deacon. I am a maker, a jeweler, an illustrator. Um, I've been working in the industry for almost 20 years um, and I recently relocated back to Melbourne after living and working in Germany for over 13 years. So I'm working on fitting back into this community, I suppose, um, and relocating back into it. We're very happy to have you back. Um, thank you, everyone, for introducing yourselves. Um, when we were thinking about the people to bring together for the core of this conversation, but we just want to be clear that everyone is part of this conversation, um, we were thinking about all the different facets, and I hate to use that word when I talk about jewellery, but of the jewellery community. Um, so I think we've got a really good reflection here of all the different aspects of it and different kind of areas that people work in. Um, the first thing we wanted to talk to you about, and I think some of us have kind of touched on it, was what the community means to you, um, I guess personally, but also professionally. Um, I've found that, like you both, it was the first community that I really felt kind of part of and, and um, I guess an understanding, um, a simpatico for want of a better word, and th that we have a sort of shorthand language that we can communicate with um, around that kind of value of object in our lives and what jewellery means to us um, that I think automatically cuts into, um, you can get to the core of things quite quickly. So I'm just wondering what others' experience has been of, of this community what it means to you. Who's, who's going to go? I'm, I'm happy Billy? to say, yeah, yeah no, I'm <laughs> happy to say, when I, when I thought about that question, I thought, what is it that connects us? And I thought it's um, very much a community of friends, as well as talking about, you know, colleagues, but, it, you know, most people become very close friends and we have a shared fascination in, in the visual and the tactile, and that's sort of what connects yeah. Immediately. So. Yeah, the connectivity. Yeah. Claire? Um, I guess I haven't actually known any other professional community. I sort of came straight out of high school from the country and then moved to Melbourne and was just in it, I guess. I don't know. But I just forced my way in. <laughs> <laughs> I find that's quite difficult as well because 
yeah, I don't know another community like mm. a painting or sculpture community, but I think our community is relatively small, mm. so we don't have the luxury of moving to a town where there's, you know, old and young painters. Contemporary jewellery is a very small facet within jewellery alone. Mm. So mm. we sort of, when you find someone who knows your craft or someone says, oh, I know what contemporary jewellery is, you sort of gravitate so towards them yep. and you have yeah. an instant dialogue, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. And that was, I was talking to someone about this last week at the opening that the first time I travelled once I was involved in this community was a completely different experience because it meant that you sort of had friends everywhere, yeah. you know, like that you'd never met before, but you'd go to an opening in another country and immediately be able to kind of talk to people about something that had meaning for both of you, which I think is a real blessing, mm. um, so mm. without being cheesy. What about you, Katie? Um, I, I agree with, with your comment about travel. It does completely reframe travel wherever you go. Mm. Um, and I just got back from Europe and um, had the most wonderful time. Everywhere you go, people email you and say, would you like to visit my studio? Would you like to come to our college? Would you like to come and see what we're doing? So there's this immediate feeling of collegiality and inclusiveness. Um, and I think that the size of our community being small we have by necessity always had to support each other. I think in some ways um, the competitiveness, the, the aggression that you might find in some other creative industries, and I know this from friends and partners and things, um, we, we tend not to have that here because we have to support each other and we, um, we are there to create opportunities together with each other and however however much we might have various small groups within our community, overall, we are very collegial and very supportive. Mm. Kel, what about you? We specifically wanted New Zealand as part of this conversation because you guys have such an incredibly vibrant and active and yeah, supportive. exciting, supportive community. And I remember a couple of years ago, we were talking about how nice everyone is in, in New Zealand, but genuinely, like everyone, like following on from what Katie's saying, that we all have to support each other. I, we see a real strength of that in New Zealand. And you for us too, you're always part of RADPAB, you're always like mm. joining and, and making things happen. So what's the secret? <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's not a secret, but it's that same thing. We, we do have to play nicely because it is small here. Mm. But at the same time, there is still um, there's still critical feedback. So that's one of the things that we try and offer within our community because we have so few writers, which is you know something that we really have to work on growing. Because well, everybody everywhere it's a it's a problem for everyone. But that having having access to uh, group of people that you trust who will provide critical feedback so you're not just in your own studio going round and round. So for me, I think that's one of the things that I most love about our community is the willingness that somebody, I, I ring and having an art crisis and somebody will come and spend a couple of hours, as would I for them, in the studio to talk through where they're at and, and how they need to move it forward or something they've missed. So so I think um, that's something that that we all really give time to because there are so few options for that. But, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm actually going to break from here for a second and throw to everybody. Do you feel that Melbourne has a similar strength in that it sounds to me like that's a very open and direct kind of aspect of the way that New Zealand community connects and supports each other and I mm. feel like I've had conversations with people about that maybe the lack of critique or th that we're not so forthcoming with that has anyone got any thoughts on that oh. hang on hang on sorry Anna we've just got to get a mic to you thank you um, I, I, and now I can't remember what I was going to say. It's the size of the community. <laughs> um, it's this, I, I do think that there's a lack of thoughtful and intelligent criticism um, yep. in Melbourne, and I think it's because the, the bridges are only short, you know, but, and to burn them, it can be quite damaging, you mm. know. Um, 
and people are sensitive. Mm. So I think that because we are all so nice to each other, um, which is a wonderful thing, yeah. but I think that's just one of the, the downsides to it. Yeah. Mm. But how do you get around that in New Zealand, Kel? Because it's even smaller there, right? So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, it's probably more in how you do it. And, and because um, we've all come through the few um, education uh, opportunities together and the, the Handshake Project has made a really big difference too. We're, a lot of us are connected up through that. That there's, there's, there's ways that I suppose we've all developed and, you know, you find friends who you do trust. It's not just a, a random, you know, out, yeah, you know, and then people turn up and tell you, oh, it's fantastic. It's, it's not, not quite like that. But um, just, yeah, I, I'd say it's through um, the Handshake Project and through uh, our, con our connection with um, occupation artists. So there's seven or so of us in that group and we have regular crit sessions. Um, and, you know, you book your slot and you have come specifically to talk about your work. So I I'd say it's the, the formalising that. Yeah. You know, rather than it being a casual thing, it's it's formal. I need feedback. Here is the stuff. Can we talk about it, please? Yeah. So I think if you if you're given feedback when you're not necessarily looking for it, it might be a different thing. But if you've specifically asked for it, then you're going to be more receptive to what you're hearing. Yeah, possibly. Do you guys do that at North City Four? I can't remember. Sort of have crit sessions and stuff? Not no. crit sessions, no, but we do ask each other for help. Yeah. You know, sort of, or like to work through a problem or something. And, yeah. Or is this working? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely found probably through school just a really good group of friends that I do trust and that I know will say that's not working, you can do better than that, you can resolve it better. Yep. But also I think I've, you know, I went to a lot of the sessions, membership sessions at Craft Victoria office, um, which have that, you know, bring in your products and it's not necessarily jewellery specific, but they do have, you know, people there that are in the contemporary jewellery world. So um, that was a place where I, very early on I could get myself used to constructive criticism and it actually I went in thinking that perhaps it would actually make me sort of shrink back into myself but it actually took my work gave me the courage to take my work in a direction that I wanted to take it in and to you know spend more time on traditional skills and things like that so I think things like that um like Kel was saying, is very invaluable so that you do have that opportunity to actually get constructive criticism when you know the person may, know, it may be completely objective and doesn't know you and isn't going to just be kind for the, for the sake of it because they don't want to hurt your feelings. So, yeah, things like that I think are important. Can I, can I jump in? I'd love to ask Laura about your experiences in Germany at the Academy in relation to this because it's a very different structure to the education systems we have here. Mm. Would you talk a little bit about what critical feedback was like there? Yeah, sure. I was wondering if I should say something because it's, um, yeah, it's quite brutal. Yeah, it's definitely a learned process. You know, in Munich you study for six years doing a master's, doing your master's, and um, you actually sit around a table similar to this, but you don't show any work for, for the first year. So first you just... Year. Mm. Mm. You can, if you wish to, but um, in general, they, you just have, you just make and learn the language and kind of, yeah, get your head around it. Of course, because it's all in German as well, so in general, you're just like <laughs> wondering <laughs> what was said, and I think that sounded, did that sound good? And she looks kind of upset. I think it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, Phew. so that's stressful enough, you know, without actually putting your own work on the table, but. And then, yeah, you sit around with perhaps 20 people um, and you, you put your work out. And it's, a good, it's a, good, uh, a good opportunity to learn both giving, you know, getting criticism but also giving it um, and being able to stand up for your work and mm -hmm. say, like, um, that's interesting that you don't, you know, see that because this is where I was thinking about, oh, okay. And so you, could, you have a chance to kind of go back and forth. It's difficult, though, really hard. Um, and then, yeah, sometimes the work's just not ready. So 
I think like Kel was saying, you sort of, we have a roster, and sometimes you're just not ready to go, mm. so you have to negotiate with someone else in the class if you can switch around. And so then, you know, the work has to be to a certain point. There's no point in sort of showing drawings or, you know, those first kind of trials, because no one will say anything, because they're just like, well, it's really hard to be critical of something that someone can then say, well, it's not finished, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and then you do that probably twice a year for about five years, and then, and then you're done. Wow. Yeah. And do you find over there that people still have those conversations once, once you're out of the academy? You do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's definitely like a core group of people who I would then, since I finished, still bounce ideas off and yeah. obviously still exhibit with and, and stuff like that. You sort of tend to, you know, you build bonds through that experience as well. Yeah. And there's definitely people who take the criticism much um, better, better? yeah, I wanted to say, yeah, more comfortably than other people. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's tough sometimes. Yeah. Mm. I think we've already started um, to answer the second question, which is what is it that you think makes us so active in terms of exhibiting, thinking, talking about the art form? Lindy, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, uh, look, I think, um, you know, we have so very many committed individuals and collaborators who want to build and maintain the communities. You know, for example, you two is one. Um, and so many more, you know, in the schools, lecturers, um, even groups of people that we've um, formed, you know, good friendships with myself, th say, through studying in honours. We've done a lot of things together. Um, and that's just ongoing. And, um, and I think the opportunities and events that we have, such as Radiant Pavilion, the JMGA conferences, Craft Victoria, the seminars they put on, the Craft Award... Um, and resources such as, of course, the galleries, the schools, um, chances to do master classes are just like so valuable. That's just been a huge thing for me. And I know a number of people have done them and they've always just been great fun. It's a great investment um, on so many levels. And um, I think in most of the kind of groups I've worked closely with, there's always been a great diversity um, of experience and background um, in a given group. So that will add something and um, it's very valuable and yeah. rewarding. Mm. Great. Vito, have you seen things sort of change over a number of years? How do you see the differences between...? Well, when I first um, graduated, I think, um, like in the... Uh, and it probably still happens, it's probably that I'm sort of a little bit on the outer these days, but um, there was a very vibrant sort of city jeweller sort of um, community, um, and it was a great... Um, community to enter, you know, as an emerging um, practitioner. Um, I think there are more. It's probably grown since then and um, diversified a bit. Um, but on the, on the um, sort of question of, you know, exhibiting together and, and that sort of thing, I suppose in my area of practice it's a little bit different, there are less opportunities, yeah. um, you've got to um, try and make your own opportunities for exhibiting and um, um, yeah, I think, that, and that, you know, that, that's a sort of sub-community which is even smaller still. Yeah. yeah, and do you think people do make their own opportunities more so now or previously or people just continue throughout, like if people want to make something happen they just do it? Well, a bit of both, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, has anyone's got anything else on that? We might move on to question three, um, which is going to be asked by you, Fang. <laughs> oh, hang on, we might. Oh, we'll just leave, leave the, the mic. mic. Um, uh, hang on, hang on, oh, hang on. Okay. Jewelry can be an isolating studio practice. How do the ways in which we gather, strengthen, and engage our community? Thanks, you think. <laughs> Does anyone want to? Belinda? Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Respond to that. Um, I thought about that and I thought, um, like, I have a very varied practice where I've got a studio at home now, which I have had for a long time. That social aspect comes from teaching, so being in a workshop with lots of other students, um, you know, coming to to work together, um, and then sort of the exhibition workshop attendance, being part of the community, you know, means that you get out there and participate 
you know, um, being in, you know, RADPAV, going to the JMGO conference, those kinds of things keep you really engaged in the community. Yeah. And what about you, Kelly? Do you ever feel isolated as a community in New Zealand? Or, like, I think I certainly feel quite connected to New Zealand as our community. Um, yeah, how do you feel? It's, it's really easy to feel isolated here. Um, because we're, we are so far from, you know, it's bloody expensive to go anywhere and do anything. And our opportunities, uh, you know, we, we, I think we punch above our weight considering we're only 4 million people and the, the courses and the um, quality of some of our galleries uh, is, is really great. But I think um, the thing that we do so that we aren't as isolated is that we'll look for international opportunities frequently because there's few here, but we'll also do stuff which sort of to some extent um, answers the previous question as well. Um, we'll do things that are not necessarily jewellery related. So we we participate in parking space each year, which is a um, it's a, an international initiative that is... Um, where basically the council allocates, it's public art, the council allocates a parking space and you perform or exhibit whatever in that parking space in town for the day. And so we've done that for the last, I think, four years now and um, it's just, it, it feeds our practice, it keeps it sort of diverse. We're not isolated even though we don't have... Um, as many opportunities as some of the bigger countries. But it also, it broadens our focus, which I think, um, you know, always keeps it interesting for us and hopefully for an audience. So I th think I just answered that question. <laughs> it also made me think, oh, you, uh, you say about feeling isolated and reaching for international opportunities, and I think that's something that I noticed would have been the first time I went to Schmuck in Munich, which is, um, I'm sure everyone here knows about it, but there's a, an annual event that happens in Munich around a central exhibition, and like uh, it's, it's grown to have this satellite program of shows, and um, RADPAV is a similar kind of thing. Um, and what always strikes me every time I'm there is the incredible presence of New Zealand. Like, it's much stronger than Australia, and you say, like you say, you're punching above your weight, in, but in terms of size, but actually your presence is incredible. Um, and I, yeah. yeah, it's really impressive and yeah, I admire it a lot. I think it's worth yeah, out. so we don't have any holidays apart from jewellery holidays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on jewellery holidays. <laughs> well, I, I think it's worth pointing out in relation to New Zealand's presence everywhere is they have a very supportive government as well, far more supportive than Australia has in terms of funding, in terms of opportunities for artists. Um, the more I travel, the more I realise how much work we have to do in lobbying our government for the funding to make our presence felt beyond our own shores. I do worry that we do get increasingly insular yep. because we're not offered those opportunities. We don't have the money to go and show our work overseas and so we do tend to end up talking to ourselves a little bit. Yep. And that's where I feel like my gallery has a big role to play is bringing work to you guys to show you from overseas and hopefully having that in some ways bounce back as well. But government is important so we do need to take on a political role as well. Yeah, it's definitely true. And yeah, it's interesting because I've seen the funding shift yeah, like you say, to be become more insular as though they've kind of forgotten that it's important to have relationships outside of Australia, um, which is disturbing on a number of levels. Um, but I think, yeah, there's definitely work to be done there. Um, and, I, yeah, I think connecting with New Zealand more, maybe in doing that together, would also be a really good idea, nice idea. Um, who's... Uh, we've got Vicky Mason with our fourth question. Hang on. <laughs> Does this connectedness... Hang on, hang on. It won't record anyway. Does this connectedness influence the work being made? If so, how? We kind of already started getting into that a bit. But, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Vicky. <laughs> um, did anyone else have something to say on that? Like, yeah, what Katie was saying about how the work I, does get into I that. Just, yep. I just think it's also not 
it's important to focus on a connectedness within the community, mm. but I think that we need to also find other connections mm. outside mm. of the community mm. um, and to, to get, gain other perspectives. Mm. Um, otherwise, we're always inward looking. Yeah, we're in a bubble. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, I agree. And it's really exciting looking at some of the projects that are starting to happen in terms of people collaborating with um, other disciplines, design and architecture and fashion. All sorts of things are really starting to happen because, and, and I think largely maybe Instagram has a lot to do with this, people are seeing a much broader range of, of disciplines and of work and are starting to have direct connections in ways of talking to each other. So I'm really hopeful that... Um, that any kind of insularity is going to be broken up mm. and we may need to um, seed some of the boundaries that we've created for ourselves that we might in some ways hold quite jealously. We might need to get a little bit more um, generous in letting those go. <laughs> but I think that um, the future is really exciting if we can really embrace that collaboration with other disciplines. Yeah. I think jewellery has a... It treads the line between design, craft and fine art. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it, it sort of wants to be all three, but it doesn't want to be any. any. <laughs> and so as a result, fine art doesn't really want it. Design kind of wants it sometimes, and craft is like, well, happy to have it you know, there. <laughs> so, w yeah, which means that you have, you know, you have people doing really interesting things between all of those sort of, you know, different areas where one bleeds into the other. Someone might work more specifically in a fine art contemporary jewellery way, uh, someone else might be much more design based. And so you do get the bleed, interestingly, but also you get a lot of resistance yeah. from, yeah, from sort of being pushed a little bit outside of that, oh, well, you know, it's um, contemporary jewellery, it's not fine art, it's got the word jewellery on it. And so I think it works for us and against us. Mm, I agree. And it often ends up being the conversation, doesn't it? Like, how do you define it? What does it mean? Like, there's a there's a symposium that happens every year. Remember, it's like somewhere north in Scandinavia, maybe. And it's like the question is always, "What is contemporary jewellery?" And I'm like, "How can you? How? How do they do this every year?" They just need to come here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I told my parents. I was like, "You need to come to see." Lisa Walker, mm. but let me come with you <laughs> because um, you yeah. need a guide. You just need someone to hold your hand a little bit, otherwise you'll just be like completely exhausted, yeah. I think. And mm. and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, you mm. know. Like my parents are really keen, like, yeah, you know, we'll, you know, come and have a look. But without context, a little bit of context, yeah. you know, then then I think it maybe gets a bit lost. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that's that's okay, yeah. you know. Yeah. A textile artist a friend of mine was saying, cause she came to see the show, and she said it's just, like, her favourite thing. Cause she yeah. said it just completely blew open yeah. what jewellery is and why, and she saw it more as sculptural, which, um, of course, it is. And so, yeah, it's nice to kind of get that reflection from... Well, good and really important, I think, to get that reflection from other people and other traditions and other craft disciplines. So, yeah. yeah. Um, we might... Have a look back at something we started talking about earlier about the shared studio spaces with a question from Anna Davis. <laughs> our question. Yes, this, this is your <laughs> this question. This is our but question, you know, but it's Anna I asking could have chosen our question. This question. <laughs> yeah. um, the shared studio space has a strong history in Australia, such as Workshop 3000 um, in Melbourne, Grey Street Workshop in Adelaide, and that wonderful studio in Brunswick, <laughs> North City 4. <laughs> what is it that makes such spaces so significant? Thanks, Anna. Anna, you want to have a go at that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> They're just awesome because <laughs> <laughs> you get to work with other people, um, which I guess speaks back to that um, jewellery is an isolating practice. That's something I've always avoided. Have you ever worked alone no. in comparison to oh working God, in a no. shared studio? <laughs> <laughs> I feed off other people all the time. I get my ideas from other people and conversations and things, so... Um, I think if I was just in my own headspace, I would probably just watch TV, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Um, there's no energy there. But, you know, you put me in a studio that's full of people and, like, we're all kind of, you know, jewellery, yes, give it a go. <laughs> like, you know, get stuck into it. What is that? <laughs> Why am I making that? <laughs> um, 
that stuff. And other people say, we don't know, but you're a champ. <laughs> <laughs> and then you keep going. See? It's oh, good. Sounds lovely, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have experiences of yeah, working in... I'd love to comment on that. Um, I was a um, tenant at Grey Street many moons ago, and I think I credit my entire sort of career to this point because of that introduction. So I met Catherine Truman when I just graduated, and she said, come to Adelaide, come from Perth, and it was like, okay, you know, <laughs> and I did. And I mean, post Jam Factory, I went to Grey Street, and I think entirely because of Catherine and Sue and Julie and Leslie as just the most amazing mentors, you know, so fortunate to have been there to watch, you know, sort of the discipline of their practice, to know what an arts career could look like, um, to see how committed they were to it. Um, but also, you know, I, re I remember having this conversation with Catherine later on, was that, you know, she knows when you first start there, everybody sort of hides at their bench, doesn't want to show anything. You know, you're really, really shy and then you start to emerge. And so that confidence, that sort of self-belief that you can actually, you know, make it and, you know, put work out there and feel confident, you know, entirely came because of their mentorship. Yeah. So it's great. They're amazing mm. people. What about you, Fiona? Have you set up a studio since you finished? Um, I haven't. I, I did sort of... Um, I have a, a shed out the back of my house. I learnt early on from coming from dressmaking and just by my nature being quite a recluse and... My creative headspace is very much a, an isolating, something I do alone, often you know, late into the night. Um, but I did find that it's not really good for you as a human <laughs> over a long period of time. Um, and so I really swore that I would, you know, this time round I would approach things differently and if I couldn't afford to be in a, a shared workshop space that I would still remain active in the community through other ways so that I had that... Um, it's definitely, uh, it doesn't necessarily change the work I make, but it definitely keeps me motivated, focused, makes me realise that, uh, as you were saying, what an art practice could look like. Um, and, yeah, it just keeps you sort of able to continue on going. So I definitely think um, that's what draws me to that, that whole idea and hopefully one day I'll <laughs> be part of a, a, a shared a shared workspace. And definitely, um, even if it doesn't change your work, it makes your life more expansive. You know, opportunities that you didn't think were possible, shared experiences, things like that. It, in that way, it changes your work. Yeah. There is something really special about visiting someone's workshop as well, isn't there? Like, yeah. you sort of... Um, whether it's a shared space or not, there might be two or three or even just someone singularly, and you kind of... You're invited into their space and you see all the little drawings and the little tiny model and that thing that they found on the side of the road or, you know, everything's sort of laid out for you there. And one thing I think is interesting, I shared a space straight after moving out from the academy uh, with four other people in just one very big room. So it was, we were just each in, in the, one of the corners. And I thought it was amazing. I was just, I loved the space. I loved the people I shared it with. And eventually we had to move out, I think perhaps two years later. And... I was like, I'm never going to find anything like that. It's just such a tragedy. We all sort of separated. And then I moved into a place with two other people, but it was like an apartment. So it was three separate rooms. And I was like, oh, like we're not going to be in the same space. And I have to say, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I, I would never go back to sharing a big room. I really enjoy being able to close the door. Of course, I love to be able to open it as well. Mm -hmm. But there's times when I'm just not ready to have the door open, mm -hmm. or like I'd be working on something, I'm not ready to show it yet, like mm -hmm. it, to anyone, not even myself, you know, I just want to make mistakes and fail and and not have like eyes in the back of my head, so yeah, I think there's benefits in both, but yeah, that was the experience for me. I think what's significant about those three studios mentioned is that they have uh, their own way of connecting in t back into the community. It's not just about what's happening within the four walls of those studios, so that whether it's through mentoring or public programs, they, they engage mm. outside of the, those studio walls and bring people in. Mm. I think that's a really important aspect of those. And they're sort of like, well, they're a community space too, especially <coughs> something like North City 4 and Grey Street. They're, they're, they're like a 
a place you can go, you know. They're a hub um, or a home. So. Mm. We're running a little bit short on time, oh. so we might go to um, Nikki Hepburn's question. <laughs> Our question. <laughs> How can we make more space be made for non-maker, curator, writer, collector, wearer, viewer, etc.? Yeah. So how can we, yeah, how can we make more space and do we need to make more space for people who aren't maker, maker, maker? I think sometimes we really focus on just the makers and there is so much more to our community. Katie, did you want to? Oh, I'm not sure that it's the maker's role to make those other Mm -hmm. spaces. I think that you are doing enough by what you do in making. Um, I think if what you're making is meaningful to other people, those spaces will naturally open up. If people are interested in your work, they will want to write about it. Um, if people are interested in wearing your work, they will buy it. Spaces will open up where you can sell it. Of course, you know, within reason, you, you can uh, do a lot to encourage the dissemination of your own work, particularly these days, uh, more than ever. But I, I, uh, I think makers really need to focus on the making um, uh, in as much as we, do, we all need to encourage other spaces to open up. I, I think that making is very important. Yeah, thank you. Um, what about the audience, given that we're... Yeah running out on time. Does anyone have anything they've wanted to pick up on or bring to the conversation? Hi, Roseanne. We'll do Roseanne first. Um, thank you, panel and um, audience question <laughs> providers. Um, I, uh, I know we're kind of easing our way into this, um, these weekly workshops um, and community is as good a place as any to start. But I, I, I've been feeling really uncomfortable with it as a, as a gathering device. Um, this format? The word, com yeah. Oh, community. Or the word yep. community as a gather, you know, a way of gathering, mm -hmm. actually. And wondering... The other option was industry and wondering um, what happens when you describe yourself as a community, as a kind of a critical kind of launching sort of device. And, and it's, it's making me feel a bit suffocated <laughs> <laughs> and stifled because... Um, I think it, it requires, it, it, it tends to produce a kind of an effect of speaking to yourself mm. and, you know, its ongoingness uh, requires itself to affirm itself over and over again without really identifying what's critical or what's um, at stake or this, why aren't we? feeling connected? Why are we feeling mm. isolated? Why are we being described by various different commentators like a bubble, an island, uh, an airport business lounge, <laughs> uh, or a school within a school? Mm. And so I think it's not a question that can be answered, but I think it's really something as a community, we need to be um, progressing a bit more and maybe actually enabling ourselves to talk about the conflict, the tension, because that might be where it's more interesting. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Roseanne. I think it's a tricky thing. Thank you for bringing it up because I think it is something that... Um, people maybe... Sort of like the critique thing we were talking about earlier people get a bit uncomfortable to kind of raise that question or say like, hey, actually, I'm not comfortable or I don't feel a part of this or I don't want to be part of this, but I do this. Um, I s oh, Manon, sorry. Um, yeah, I certainly feel suffocated sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, um, Roseanne, that was a, a really good point, yeah. very sharp. Um, 
I also think um, when talking about these things, I find it actually quite useful to look at how other disciplines handle these issues. Um, I'm obviously from a different place, and in that sense from a very different background, also in terms of education. Um, I teach here within fine arts. Um, I work across disciplines within my practice. So I think I can comfortably say that, you know, I think within disciplines like fine art, for example, um, people are a lot more comfortable with the idea of critique mm -hmm. um, and can be a bit more direct even, you know, it's still respectful, but constructive criticism is not something that you know, we jewelers tend to be very good at amongst each other. Um, and I think this is something that is very much a role of education, where this is, you know, really where you should be learning that as a skill. Um, I also think, you know, Katie was saying we should, as makers, not feel responsible for all the other parts of practice. Um, but within visual arts, actually, fine artists have always very actively engaged, for example, with writing, um, because they felt like it was necessary to take a bit more control of that um, so that, you know, they were actually part of the conversation and not leave the conversation to others. Um, so I think those are pretty important things for us to consider as well. Great. Did anyone want to speak to the, any of this? Otherwise, we had another question. Oh, and another one. Uh, just very uh, quickly. Why um, did you do that? <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to follow up with Manon about that. You know, it really is important that we are responsible for our own our environmental structures that sit outside making. Otherwise, we can't progress. And um, and I think think to, to take a position now, we'll leave it to somebody else is just crazy, you know, I mean, I think we really do I need... I wasn't saying... No, no, I'm not pointing it at you. It should all be left to yeah. No, 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 but I think, I think that's, that's how we grow, and, that, that's, and, and, and that's how we engage with the community, and that's where jewellery goes beyond being self-referential, and I think that's really important, as this exhibition, despite, um, you know, it, it's probably the norm now uh, in contemporary jewellery, but this is where Lisa really did set, set a, I think, a really interesting discussion. I think there really is an amazing community here, just coming from outside, but also being from here. Like, it's, it's amazing uh, just seeing how many people are involved in this community. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think it's amazing, Rad Pav, and it seems like there's a bit of a shift in what's happening here. There's constantly something going on, so I think that's interesting. And Munich is, you know, it, is, it does have its own community, but things really only happen at that jewellery time. There'll be the occasional opening, but really more occasional lecture at the university. But other than that, it's just concentrated to that time. Mm. So it's nice to have this constant sort of bits and pieces like this, and yeah, I think it's great. because uh, Roseanne and I are sitting in some kind of <laughs> uh, field, field, field of forces here. But yeah, I, I was also feeling, you know, like just this reiteration of the word community was like, oh, okay. So this idea of gathering is about community. And, you know, wondering if that just reflects a particular time as well. And also perhaps a particular composition, because looking around here, like who has gathered, it's predominantly female. And so this idea is sort of, and you know, like that's, that's, I'm not saying that as a critical thing, you know, like, but that is maybe sort of articulating this idea of community and belonging. And it just made me think, well, you know, in the past, like what other words might have been used? Yeah. So, and with, you know, I don't know if it was, but the idea of a cult, <laughs> you know, like, or the idea of the avant-garde, you know, like, which are also gatherings, but have a very different kind of interaction yeah, around, you know, yeah. around what's happening. So I just, I do, you know, coming back to, you know, maybe this kind of idea of critique and critical and, you know, yeah, that there's something also in thinking about, well, what is this gathering and how does it gather? gather and, you know, like cults can then, you know, that they're, they're kind of inclusion, exclusion, and there's yep. debates and there's, 
you know, people feeling like they don't belong and, you know, like, but there's just dynamics around different kinds of gatherings yeah. that I think, yeah, you know, so, but maybe we are just in this time where a sort of sense of community is important in some way, but there was just a lot of the reiteration was like being, going into a community. So it was like this idea of the community is already there. And I sort of think that communities need to be established and not kind of givens that one just, I don't know, maybe it's kind of connecting up with some of the comments that you're raising, Roseanne. You're looking at me like I'm kind of like, <laughs> but just looking. Yeah. I think, yeah, the cult is quite an yeah, interesting yeah. one because it is, yes, I think you could draw many comparisons to jewelry and cults. Um, and I think for me, one of the reasons this community was because it's more like industry is quite good, but I think community has another aspect of the personal, which is very present in what happens within jewelry, because often it is, you know, you have another job or you do something else, like this is more, this takes up a lot of your life and you end up using like resources and things that, you know, just extra, you always put extra in, like, you have friendships, you have, like, so much of your life intertwined into this thing that we do. That's why cult is good too, thank you for that, Susie, because... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know, no, 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 and I think, I think it really depends on, um, I don't know, everybody's personal experience. I think, I reckon I've had both experiences with jewellery, that it's been a community and it's been really... Um, important to me, very formative in, I guess, who I am and what I see my contribution as being. Um, but then also, yeah, it can feel like a cult and it can feel like, you know, it's just... Uh, yeah. I think it's kind of curious that the word personal is coming up now too. Mm. You know, this kind of connection with the per you know, my personal experience. And that just makes me think of, um, say, for example, the... Australia, you know, the Order of Australia and how, you know, you sort of see people wearing this and it kind of, so it's not, that's not a cult or it might be like, but, you know, mm. it's kind of, but, but, but there is this kind of, you know, so it's not personal, it's, it's kind of, you know, there's these other kinds of connections and forces and that, that are happening, that, yeah. that gather, gather something together. It's not personal and people but it's gathering something else and articulating something else. And, you know, you can see, watch somebody on TV and, you know, they've got that on. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, it sort yeah. of connects up with other things and it gathers a whole lot of other things. So, but, yeah, cults do that, societies do it, you know, so on and so on. So, or clubs. Maybe it's a club. <laughs> <laughs> that so, might yeah. be. Which, incidentally, is a piece of jewellery they're wearing that signifies <laughs> for logging in that club. So that would suggest that there's some sort of intent with the gathering. There needs to be a, 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 you know, a direction or an intent or a... Um Which then would make it a movement, really. Mm. Yeah. Good, yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's part of the difficulty that we've always had as a contemporary jewellery community. I hate waving my fingers <laughs> like that, but anyway. Um, is that there is this inherent tension and an insecurity about having a community because what we do is very personal. It is often isolated and um, there is no, as much as we tried to frame one in the 1970s, there really is no kind of common cause by which we're gathering and directed. Um, even in a cult, you have a kind of a common cause. Yeah, yeah. Um, or a I belief or so, like yeah. something common. Yeah. I, th I think the nature of, of everyone's practice is inherently personal and, and that does sometimes create tension when it comes to thinking of oneself as part of a community. Yeah. Um, and we, yeah, I did want to know, like, in yeah, New Zealand, we're is that the case? Almost out of time. So, Kel, do you want to close anything to contribute before we finish up? Um, one, one thing that we, as a, a small group, um, Occupation Artist, we have a, an art philosopher as part of our group. So there's seven of us and her. She's a non-maker. Um, but for us, she essentially is making, she's making ideas all the time and she comes from such a different place to all of us that she feeds that sort of that more outward-looking thing that we tend not to do as jewellers. And I think um, she also gives us a, a sort of more of a licence to participate in 
other non-jewellery things like Parking Day and, you know, there's various other things. And I think that the more people from, um, I think, like uh, Roseanne was saying, industry or other places that you can bring into jewellery, the more we sort of, not saying disseminate, but actually just keep it interesting for ourselves and less of the looking in, more looking out. So, and and I thought uh, that that uh, making out really did that. You know, there was speakers from um, Yoni Scarce, uh, Yuani, sorry, Yuani Scarce, was, she was a highlight for lots of us just because her ideas were not jewelry, but, you know, yeah. really in depth of ideas, fantastic making. You know, so I think that we all know jewelry, but looking out, the more people from other places that we bring in, the more interesting we'll be for ourselves and for other people. And an extension of that, if you want to position yourself amongst a broader community, you have to, or, whoops, not the community word, a broader, I don't know, field, then you have to understand that those fields as well. So I think it's twofold. It's, you know, making yeah, yeah. life interesting, but also, you know, respecting what other people do and, and understanding where it all fits at large. Oh, one more. Yeah, no, I just... I just wanted to respond to um, the emphasis on this idea of jewelry being so personal um, and also uh, this idea of us being so isolated. And I think, you know, there's so many visual artists that also work by themselves in studios. We don't seem to view that as such an isolated practice. I work by myself. I don't feel isolated at all. Um, and what is so personal about making jewelry when it is actually an object that requires other people to take it into the world. I mean, you know, if you make sculpture, it can be completely autonomous. It doesn't need anyone. Um, in our case, that's completely different. It is about people, always. Mm -hmm. So this emphasis on it being so extremely personal, I find a little bit weird. Well, yeah, I mean, but you can look at personal in different ways too. Like it's personal as in, people, right? Like it's, mm. I'm, I'm very personally attached to all of the work that I wear um, and I haven't made any of it and I don't make. Um, so I guess, you know, it's not just personal in terms of, you know, maybe what Warwick thought about this when he made it, but it's um, personal for me. It becomes a personal relationship that the wearer has or the, the people that interact with it have. Anything else you want to say, Claire? Because I think I think we are out of time. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for our lovely panel for being part of this today, and thank you for everyone for coming along and being part of the audience. We had such great questions from the audience. That was excellent. <laughs> Not the ones we wrote. I meant the ones at the end. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you.